What's going on everybody? Drew Peters, the mad scientist at Dragon Pharma. And today on Dragon Science, we're back for the latest installment of Dragon Pharma Mythbusters. Today on Dragon Science Mythbusters, we're going to cover one of the most common supplements in existence, creatine. There's a lot of different myths out there, a lot of different topics, but today we're covering the top five. So let's dive on in. First and foremost, what is creatine? Creatine is also known as methylguanidine acetic acid. It's a natural occurring molecule derived from amino acids and primarily stored in skeletal muscle. It combines with phosphate to form phosphocreatine and serves as a readily available source of energy in the body, specifically adenosine triphosphate, also known as ATP. It was first isolated in 1832 and proposed as an ergogenic aid in the early 1920s. However, the effect on body composition and performance were largely unknown until the early 1990s. That's a long gap. It's synthesized in the body and consumed as part of an omnivorous diet or in supplemental form. Over the years, there have been many misconceptions and myths arising about creatine, so let's dive into that top five. Number one, creatine causes water retention. This is likely due to the early research on creatine that showed supplementation at 20 grams a day for six days was associated with some water retention. The studies have shown that three days of supplementation increased total body water and extracellular and intercellular water as well, leading people to believe that retention over the long-term supplementation was standard. Now, let's take a little bit deeper dive here. Creatine is osmotically active. It increases the body's total creatine content, which could increase in total body water retention. It's taken up into the muscle from circulation via sodium-dependent transport. The transport involves sodium to water, which will also be taken up in the muscle to help maintain intracellular osmolality. Given the activity of sodium potassium pumps, however, it's not likely that intracellular sodium concentration will be dramatically affected. When we look at the longer term studies of 5 to 10 weeks, there's no increases in total body water. One such study loaded with 20 grams a day for 7 days, followed by 5 grams per day maintenance phase for 21 days. The results indicated that in males or females, there was no difference. And most telling, a recent study has also examined the effect of supplementation plus resistance training for eight weeks. It found increased amounts of total body water. However, the ratio of skeletal muscle to intracellular water remained similar, meaning that water is localized only in the muscle cell, not subcutaneous under the skin in that water retention phase. Now, ICW is important as it's a signal for protein synthesis and drives lean mass over time. Benefiting, of course, one of the main things people take creatine for, increased lean mass. So, in summary, when it comes to water retention and creatine, it's possible to have a little bit of a water spike in the first few days, but past that, it's not supported. It does not cause water retention. So overall, this first myth is conclusively busted. Next up, creatine is a steroid. We've heard this one a lot. I'm not sure where it stems from. However, let's take a closer look here at exactly why and how to clarify this once and for all. Anabolic steroids are synthetic versions of the hormone testosterone, an androgenic hormone used with resistance training with the inherent uh, task of enhancing muscle mass and strength due to increases in muscle protein synthesis. However, as we covered in the last part of this, creatine is nothing like that. The mechanism of action and chemical structure are completely different. So very simply, this one's absolutely busted. Number three, creatine damages kidneys. One of the most common concerns when creatine supplementation comes up is overall kidney damage. The main concern traced back to a 1998 study where there was an imperfect understanding and interpretation of creatine and creatinine metabolism. In skeletal muscle, both creatine and fossil creatine are degraded over time into creatinine, which is then exported to the blood and excreted through the body through the urine. Healthy kidneys filter creatinine, which would otherwise increase in the blood. Therefore, blood creatinine levels can also be used as a proxy marker of overall kidney function. The amount of creatinine in the blood is related to muscle mass, i.e. males generally have higher creatinine level than females due to higher skeletal muscle content. And both dietary and creatine creatinine intake are influenced by this. Both blood and urinary creatinine may also be increased by ingestion via supplementation or creatine containing foods such as meat. Creatine is not normally present in urine, but can if it reaches very high levels of ingestion, such as 10 grams or greater during the day during active creatine supplementation. 
now. All of this is combined to create an unsubstantiated perspective that if kidneys are forced to excrete higher than normal levels of creatine or creatinine, some sort of overload is taking place, causing kidney damage. In reality, though, transient increases in blood or urinary creatine or creatinine due to creatine supplementation are unlikely to reflect a decrease in kidney function. Over 30 years of studies and research on creatine has demonstrated no adverse effects with renal markers so when using recommended dosage of creatine. So this one has no evidence and is thoroughly busted. Number four. Next up, creatine causes dehydration and cramping. This one stems from the early 2000s. With limited data and based primarily on speculation, the American College of Sports Medicine recommended that individuals controlling their weight and or exercising intensely in hot environments avoid the use of creatine. The physiological rationale was that creatine supplementation may cause dehydration and cramping is based on the premise that creatine is a osmotically active substance found primarily in skeletal muscle. It can overall alter the whole body fluid distribution by preferentially increasing intracellular water uptake and retention, and particularly over the short term. Situations of water loss, severe sweating, increased environmental temperature, so on and so forth, and with having this bound intracellular fluid, in theory, may be detrimental to thermal regulation, leading to extracellular dehydration, electrolyte imbalance, muscle cramping, and or other heat-related musculoskeletal issues. However, as we mentioned, this was based on limited speculation evidence. On the flip side, creatine actually causing cramping goes contradictory to what the actual experimental and clinical evidence says. One such study by Greenwood et al. monitored injury rates in Division I NCAA collegiate football players where environmental conditions were hot and humid. Participants chose to receive either creatine or sports drink placebo throughout the football season. At the end of the season, overall, the injuries treated by athletic training staff were monitored and it found that creatine users had significantly less cramping, heat illnesses, dehydration, muscle tightness, muscle strains, and overall total injuries compared to non-users. In the clinical setting, hemodialysis patients who were frequently reporting muscle cramping provided creatine five minutes prior to the hemodialysis session. Overall, it was found that it reduced the frequency of symptomatic muscle cramping by 60%. These beneficial effects from creatine may be explained by fluid distribution and electrolyte imbalances as previously discussed. So, as you can see, not only is muscle cramping dehydration not true, it's been thoroughly debunked to have the opposite effect potentially. This one is also busted. Last but not least, myth number five, you need to load creatine for it to be effective. This all stems from a 1992 research paper, Harris et al., and a 1996 paper by Casey et al. It showed that loading creatine increased skeletal muscle and muscle creatine stores. Loading is defined as anywhere from a 5 to 7 day period, taking dosages of 20 to 25 grams per day, followed by a maintenance phase of 3 to 5 grams per day. In our later study in 2017, Kreider et al. dosed it as straight up 3 to 5 days of supplementation of creatine per day with no loading phase. And it demonstrated that increased intracellular muscle creatine stores for greater muscle mass, performance, and recovery. So, essentially, it accomplished the same thing. Overall, when looking at the two, the non-loading creatine dosage results delayed in maximum storage concentrations over time. However, at a certain point, they both resulted in a 20% increase. The loading protocol reaching that maximum concentration after about six days, and when dosing three grams a day after about 20 days. Which is correct is dependent on individual goals. If you're looking to maximize the ergogenic potential as quick as possible, the loading phase with a mega dose up front is probably the better choice for you. However, if you're looking over an extended period of time and want to avoid potential weight gain associated with a loading phase protocol body water increase, the maintenance phase is probably a better strategy of 3 to 5 grams per day and ride it out. So this one isn't confirmed or busted, it's a maybe. It depends on your goals. So overall, we went through this pretty quickly, but I kept it topical, kept it very direct, and kept it scientific based on the evidence of the top five myths when it comes to creatine supplementation. This has been Drew Peters on Dragon Side from Mistbusted, going over the top five creatine myths. Oh,